So we're in the fourth week of this Galatians uh, series, and uh, Jess did an amazing, amazing job last week dealing with chapter three in Galatians and talked about the law and how so often we turn our faith in Jesus into kind of a Jesus plus something else kind of thing rather than staying focused and connected uh, on Jesus. And if you didn't get a chance to see it, I would really encourage you to check it out. It's on our website. It's on YouTube. Um, Check out uh, her message. It was fantastic. This week, we're looking at the very end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four. And this is the section of the letter where Paul is all focused on uh, families, kids, families, all of that. It's a, it's a family-focused kind of thing. He's talking about family. He's talking about belonging. All of us uh, long to belong to someone or something. Like all of us want to know. All of us want to be known. All of us want to be in a relationship or in relationships where we feel protected, where we feel secure. And one of the gifts that we receive when we put our faith in Jesus Christ is inclusion into this new family. We get to be a part of this new family. It's a family that has all of the belonging and security that we could ever hope for. It's a family where no one is excluded because of race or ethnicity or gender or socioeconomic status or age or political affiliation or whatever. It's a family where we don't diminish our differences, we don't deny our differences, but we just refuse to allow those differences to keep us apart. And the Bible calls this family the family of God. It's this, it's the church. It's the people of God. It's the body of Christ. There's lots of different ways that the scripture talks about it. Now, how do we become a part of this family? How do we become a part of God's family? Well, that's what Paul is telling us in this passage. And what he's telling us is that our relationship with each other, like this family that we're a part of, our relationship with each other is all rooted in our relationship with God. And then he describes what that relationship with God looks like. And he begins by saying this, you are all sons of God, children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, according to Paul, uh, and we struggle with this sometimes, but according to Paul, not all human beings are children of God. All human beings are created by God. All human beings are created in the image of God. All human beings are loved by God, but they are not all children of God. Paul says that only happens through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in Acts 17, when Paul is addressing the government leaders and the philosophers in Athens, and some of you maybe remember that encounter where he's He's sharing the gospel. He's reasoning with these philosophers, these academic leaders. He does say, we, talking about everyone there, including those who have not put their faith in Jesus, we are God's offspring. But he's not talking about a meaningful parent-child relationship there. It's kind of like saying that Henry Ford is the father of the automobile or saying that Thomas Edison is the father of the light bulb. Yes, in a sense, every car or every light bulb proceeds from their creator. And yes, every human being, all of us, proceed from our creator. But when Paul says that we are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, he's talking about more than just the fact that we proceed from our creator. He's talking about God being our parent experientially. Sometimes a child who has been... um, emotionally abused or physically abused by their mom or by their dad will say something like, um, that person was never a real father to me, never a real dad to me, or never a real mom to me. Now, that doesn't mean that this person wasn't their biological father. It doesn't mean this person wasn't their legal father, their legal mother. It just means that this person didn't really function as their parent. They didn't have a 
parent-like relationship with their child. They didn't have the kind of relationship that a parent is supposed to have with your kid, with your child. They never really demonstrated love for them, never really cared for them. They, they, may, have had the, they may have been their parent legally, they may have been their parent biologically, but they weren't a parent to them relationally. And when Paul talks about being a child of God, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a relationship. Yes, you can say that all of us are God's children in the sense that we all proceed from our creator, but if you want to truly experience God as our loving parent, that can only happen, Paul says, through Jesus Christ. The way that we become God's children, as we'll see in the texts that follow, is by adoption. That Jesus adopts us, or through Jesus, God adopts us as his sons or as his daughters. Now, in the Greco-Roman world in which Paul lived, almost all adoptions were not adoptions of little babies like they are today. Like most adoptions today, you know, there's some adoptions that are of older children or maybe uh, even teenage kids, but most adoptions today are infants, they're young children. That's just kind of the focus of most adoptions. But these, in Paul's day, in the Greco-Roman world in which Paul lived, uh, they were almost entirely adoptions of young adults. So if you were a wealthy person, and this is where the adoptions tended to happen, if you were a wealthy person with no children, and you're getting up in years, you would adopt a son as your heir. And in a moment, the status of that adopted son would change. That person would immediately become an heir to the father's estate. And all of their old debts, if they had any debts in the past, all of their old debts would be canceled. In effect, this new adopted person was able to start an entirely new life with this new family. Now again, in this Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, the person being adopted was almost always a man. You would adopt a son because in this patriarchal society, it was only the son that could be the heir to the father's inheritance. So to be adopted meant to be adopted into sonship. But when Paul says that we are all sons of God in this particular text, he's not talking just about men. He's really saying that we are all children of God. He's talking about men and women. He's saying that, and what he's saying is incredibly radical in his time. Paul is taking a legal institution that people were familiar with, adoption, that only men could participate in, and saying that this is something that God does for everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. God adopts men and women into this family. God adopts people who are free and people who are slaves into this family. God adopts Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles into this family. Paul says that in Christ we are all adopted by God. We are all heirs of God. And that's why Paul immediately says in verse 28, which is oftentimes a verse that we read out of context and don't realize that he's saying this right after he's talked about who all is adopted into the family of God and who all can be adopted into the family of God. This is where Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. He redefines Abraham's seed. He redefines Israel. He redefines the, the promise that was given to the people of Israel. He redefines all that. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This verse is all about who gets adopted by God. It's all about who gets adopted by into God's family. It's all about who gets the Father's inheritance. Paul identifies all the people in culture who in that culture tended to be on the outside looking in. All the people who could never be adopted. 
All the people who could never gain an inheritance in that culture. All the people who would always be on the outside looking in because of their gender, their race, their background, their ethnicity, their religious background, whatever. They would always be on the outside looking in, including the Gentiles. Those who were not Jews, the Gentiles who were not Abraham's biological descendants, so they were told that they could never, ever be God's children. They could never receive the Father's inheritance. And he says, if you belong to Christ, you are a child of God. You have been adopted. You are heirs of God. Now, what does that mean to be an heir of God? What does it mean to be adopted by God? Well, it means a lot of things that we don't have time to go into all of them. But let me just mention two today. One, to be adopted by God means that you get an inheritance. Which means that if you belong to Christ, not only does something get taken off of you, and that's usually almost always what we focus on when someone belongs to Christ and puts their faith in Christ. We talk about all the things that are taken away, all the things that are taken away from them so that we talk about the fact if you belong to Christ, there are all these things that get taken off of you. Your sins are forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. You have a new beginning. Your debts are paid in full. All of these things that are taken away. And that's part of what it means to be adopted by God, to belong to Christ. But Something is also given to you when you are adopted by God. You get an inheritance. Jesus' hope becomes your hope. Jesus' joy becomes your joy. Jesus' acceptance by the Father becomes your acceptance by the Father. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. Let me just say that again. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. Can I get just a little bitty amen for that? Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. And when you realize that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs, see, here's the thing that sometimes we hear that and we say, okay, I understand that. I've been told that. I've heard that. I've heard that preach that, you know, that this is ours. If if we're in Christ and what is Jesus's, that is ours as well. But like, what does that mean? What does that actually practically mean in terms of the way that I live my life? Well, it really is like it means everything. Because when you realize that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you, it will help you not get so wound up when things don't go your way. Like if you don't get all the recognition that you think you deserve, that you know, you're involved in something, a project, whatever it is, and people get recognized, and you don't get the recognition that you think that you deserve, or if you have to deal with some criticism that you think is unjust criticism, and it seems unfair that you're being criticized for this, or if you don't succeed as fast as you thought that you would succeed, you had a master plan for your life, and this is where you would be at age 30, this is where you'd be at age 40, how much, here's how much money, here's what I would be doing vocationally, and it's not going quite as fast as you thought that it would go, you're not succeeding quite as fast as you thought that you would, like it's not a big deal because everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. If, here's, let me give you maybe a way to think about this. If all you have in the world is $100 to your name, like that's all you have, and some of you are college students, you say, man, I wish I had $100. That'd be twice of what I actually have. But if all you have in the world is $100 and someone steals it, like it's a really big deal. But if you are a multi-billionaire, and someone somehow manages to steal $100 from you, like you don't necessarily feel great about it, but you're not gonna lose any sleep over it. Like if you're a multi-billionaire and someone steals $100, like it's not that big of a deal because you have so much. Sometimes we get all wound up about things that we don't have to get wound up about because we forget our inheritance in Christ. We forget the fact 
that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to us. So when you realize that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you, it kind of changes the way that you react to the small stuff. It kind of changes the way that you react to the criticism or the lack of recognition or acknowledgement or whatever. Like It just kind of changes your perspective on all of that. So that's the first thing. Second thing, to be adopted by God means that you have unconditional access to the Father's love and protection. Unconditional access to the Father's love and protection. In Romans 8.15, which is actually a parallel passage to a passage that we're going to look at a little bit later on, Galatians 4, 6, and 7, Paul says this, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship or the spirit of adoption to sonship, which is what some of the other translations say. You receive the spirit of sonship or the spirit of adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. There's so much to unpack there and so much that we don't have time to deal with. Just such a rich passage. But I just want to focus in on the word Abba there. So the word Abba is actually, uh, it's kind of a tricky word to translate. Maybe some of you have heard some different folks deal with translations on that. And some have translated it as daddy. Like I said, Abba is like a childlike daddy and it is kind of a childlike thing. But it, it's actually probably a little more nuanced Maybe then the word daddy, Arab, uh, Abba is, a, is an Aramaic word that is perhaps a little bit better translated as Papa. And it's a word, actually it's a word that is used by children to, to relate to their parents, but it's also a term that adults use uh, as well to relate to, the, if they're in a good relationship with the parents, it's a term that adults use to relate to their parents. It's a relational term rather than a formal term. That's the difference, is that it's a relational term rather than a formal term. It implies an intimacy of relationship. So being adopted by God means that you have unconditional access to God's love. You have unconditional access to God's protection because he is your papa. You can go to him for, for anything, for any hurt, for any pain, for any praise, for any lament, for any joy, with all, of your, with all of your celebrations, like we did today, and with all of your anger. Like, um, there were so many good talks at this um, gathering that I went to, and that Josh and I went to, and, uh, but the one that wrecked me was actually not a talk. It was a panel discussion. It was a panel discussion of young leaders. Um, all were in Europe. And uh, they were talking about some experiences that they had been through, and all of them had been through some really, really, really tough experiences. One had lost uh, his brother to suicide. Uh, another one was dealing with a cancer. Another one was dealing with some really tough stuff that, that a friend was going through, physical stuff, emotional stuff, mental stuff, all of that. And, um, and they were talking about getting angry with God and how um, somehow they'd gotten the notion that if you love Jesus, that no matter what happens, that you don't get angry with God. And they began to um, realize that, no, no, this relationship, this Papa relationship, this intimate relationship with God that is not formal but relational like it can handle it can handle everything and it can handle their anger and and they talked about the anger that they have gone through and and uh and one uh talked about the fact that I don't get I don't get angry <laughs> he said I don't get angry when uh I go through tough stuff I get angry when the people that I love go through tough stuff and that's what I get angry at God 
And one of the things that they came to realize and one of the things that Paul is dealing with here and what the Spirit does is that, that God can, can handle all of that stuff, that, that you, can, you can praise Him, you can rejoice, you can lament, you can uh, celebrate, you can get angry. And, and God, you can, all of that, because he is, he is Abba, he is, he is Papa, and you can be confident that he will never, in the midst of your anger, he will never stop loving you, he will never stop being there for you, he will never abandon you, he will never turn his back on you, he will never judge you because you are angry. Because he is your Papa and you're in relationship with him. Finally, Paul concludes this section with this. He says, but when the time had fully come, God um, sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that he might receive full rights of sons, the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, Papa, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Now, um, I don't tend to like try to get buried into a lot of theological jargon or um, geek out on a lot of theological kind of stuff, but... um, This passage is just a great geek out passage. And uh, it's just so great because the Trinitarian God is on full display in this passage. You know what I mean by the Trinitarian God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. The Trinitarian God. And you see, you see this God, this Trinitarian God at work throughout Scripture, but Rarely do you have a scripture like this that is so clear where you see the Trinitarian God just at work in this passage. This is on full display. In verse four, we're told that God sent his son, God, the Father, sent his son, Jesus, into the world to redeem the world and to make us his children. And then in verse six, we're told that because we are his children, because we are his kids, because we are children of God, God sent the spirit of his son, third person in the Trinity, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts that enables us to cry out, Abba, Father, Papa. Paul is saying that the work of the son, get this, he's saying the work of the son is to make us God's adopted children, like to, to, to make that a fact in our lives. That's the work of God's of, of the Son is to make us God's adopted children and the work of the Spirit is to help us actually experience the joy of that adoption. Like the work of the Spirit is to assure us that our adoption is actually true. So the work of the Son is to uh, allow us to become the adopted kids of God, the adopted children of God. And the work of the Spirit is to actually enable us to help us to experience and enjoy that reality, live that out, to actually assure us that our adoption is true. In the story of the prodigal son, when uh, the son comes home, and some of you are familiar with that story, and I, I won't tell the whole story, but uh, the younger son leaves his father, takes his inheritance, goes to another land, and, um, and kind of walks away from um, his family, representing God in the story. And uh, finally comes to his senses and comes back. And when he comes back, the best that he can imagine could happen is that he would become uh, a hired servant, basically. Be treated like a hired servant by his father. But when he gets home... Um, the father, as you know, uh, says no way. He receives him as his son. He puts a ring on his finger. He puts a robe on him. He throws this huge party that ticks the older brother off. All that. We don't have time to talk about that. But like all these things that uh, are things that you do with your, 
your child. He puts a ring on his finger, a robe on him, throws a huge party. And all those things are great. But I think the real turning point, when it becomes real, <laughs> I think, at some level to the son, it is when, it's when the father embraces him. You remember that part of the story? He sees his son, and he runs to him, and he throws his arms around him, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. It's in that moment, I think, that the son's sonship becomes real to him. He starts to experience it again. It's an amazing, amazing story. And Paul is saying that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit helps us experience the Father's kiss. And that's so important because, and some of you maybe are going through this, some of you maybe have gone through this in the past, maybe some of you are going through this right now. You can be adopted, you can be adopted. Like you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are Adopted, you are one of God's kids, you're a child of God, you're part of the family of God, all of that. You can be adopted, the matter is settled, you're a child of God, but you're not really experiencing your sonship. Or you're not really experiencing your daughtership. And this is why the work of Jesus' spirit in our lives is so important. Because the spirit helps us actually experience the status that is already ours in Christ. Isn't that amazing when you think about the Trinitarian God? That he sends his son so that we might be adopted into this amazing family. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Everything that is Jesus, ours. And then he sends his spirit Christ's spirit to keep reminding us of what he's already done and what we've already experienced. To make sure that we don't forget, that we don't live out our sonship or live out our daughtership, that we don't forget that we are the adopted children of God. It's like when a parent, I think, when a parent takes their child into their arms and kisses them and embraces them and tells them that they love them and that you're so amazing and you mean so much to me like it doesn't change the child's status they were already they were already the parent's son or the parent's daughter they were already loved they were already secure but when the parent picks them up and embraces them and kisses them and tells them that they love them they experience that love they experience that security they experience their sonship they experience their daughtership the Spirit is what makes it possible for us to hear the same thing that Jesus heard at his baptism. The same thing that Jesus heard on Mount Tabor at the transfiguration. You remember in both occasions, the Spirit comes to Jesus when he's being baptized and when he's in the midst of his transfiguration. The Spirit comes to him and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And some of you, like, you've been adopted, you're in the family, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're an adopted child, an adopted son, an adopted daughter, but you need to hear the words of the Spirit say to you again, you are my beloved daughter. And I am well pleased with you. And some of you are like, this doesn't feel like the season where God could be pleased with me or where he even wants to acknowledge that I'm his son or acknowledge that I am his daughter. And the Spirit just keeps, the Spirit just will never give up. The Spirit just keeps coming to us and saying, you are my beloved son 
You are my beloved daughter, and I am well pleased with you. Maybe you're not living that out now. Maybe there are some things that need to change, but it doesn't change the fact that you are my son, you are my daughter, you are beloved by me, and I am well pleased with you. You don't have to earn my favor. You don't have to earn my love. You don't have to perform your way into my graces. I am well pleased. So how do we experience the Spirit of Christ in our hearts? How do we experience our adoption? Well, sometimes when we think about experiencing God and experiencing the Spirit, we tend to think of these big, flashy experiences. And sometimes it's like that, you know, but oftentimes it's not. And, it, and, and it's not about waiting for some big experience before we can do anything, waiting for some big experience before we can accept Christ or waiting for some big experience before we can do something bold for Christ or waiting for some big experience before we can make a decision. Sometimes I know folks are like, I, 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 want, to, I want to say yes to Jesus, but I'm just waiting for some big thing to happen. Some big expression of the spirit that somehow will say, yeah, now's the time. Or there's some decision that we need to make and we know probably what the decision is and what we need to do. It's like we're waiting for some big, big thing to happen that will somehow say, this is what you're supposed to do. Sometimes we just find ourselves waiting, like waiting, waiting, waiting for that big thing. And sometimes that big thing happens and Sometimes that's a part of our narrative, and that's often, but usually it isn't about big, flashy experiences at all. It's actually usually about small things. It's usually just about putting ourselves in position to hear from the Spirit. And when we meditate on who Jesus is and what He's done, when we praise him and when we worship him and when we're persistent in our prayers and not just the prayers where we're asking God for something but the prayers where we're thanking God for something where we're praising God where we're crying out to God and saying God just in the midst of all of this just let me somehow see you at work in my life and in the world, that's when we experience the Spirit of Christ in our heart. And that's when we experience the Father's kiss, the Father's embrace. And when you get a group, when you get a group of people who've experienced the Father's kiss, who know they are adopted, that they are the adopted children of God, the sons and daughters of God, and are living out of their sonship, and they're living out of their daughtership, and they know that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to them, and they're living out of their inheritance, and they know what their inheritance is, and they are so overwhelmed by what is theirs in Jesus that they don't have to be preoccupied with with their stuff and their agenda and getting their way and they can turn more outward and can can become more servant minded and and care more for others and lay down their lives for others because what they know they already have in Jesus like when you have a group of people that are like that that's when the church is the church that's when we are who we were called to be by God and all of that's possible 
because we have been adopted into this amazing, amazing family of God. God, may we never lose sight. May the Spirit, we give thanks for the Son who died on the cross and made us children of God. And we give you thanks for the Spirit that reminds us of that, that allows us to cry out, Abba, Father, that allows us to cry out, Papa, that allows us to experience that which is already ours in Christ. Lord, we give you thanks. May we live by the Spirit. May we be controlled by the Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen.